Hello, I'm Ranger Mara at Shenandoah National Park. Today we're going to be exploring some of the cultural history of this amazing place, the Big Meadow. Archaeologists have learned that people have been using this meadow for a long time. And the way they have discovered that is by coming across different bits and pieces of human activity from a long time ago. Some of those things include arrowheads, uh, spear points, pieces of, of pottery, and things like that. Some of the pieces date back thousands of years, so people have been here a long time. One of the things that they discovered were stone weights on atlatls. Those are spear throwing weapons, and uh, early hunters used those to give them a little more leverage in forcing a spear instead of using your own uh, manual power. So an atlatl, this is a reproduction, and this is the stone weight that I'm talking about, and this is the type of stone that archaeologists have found in this area. How you would use it is, this is the spear thrower part. You would have a four foot long spear, the back of the spear would go here with the tip out this way, and you would find that animal that you wanted to hunt and take your careful aim and then throw your spear in a much faster fashion than that. But you can imagine the spear arcing off and, and going to its target. So we think that people were hunting large animals here. Now, 150 to 200 years ago, there were still some large animals such as elk in Virginia and the woods bison in Virginia. It's possible that those animals were here in the big meadow and may have been some of the things that people were hunting uh, a while ago. Uh, it's possible that those hunters may have burned off this open area from time to time to encourage the, the new growth of grasses, which are perennials and will put up a nice new fresh growth of green. And that's what a lot of those grazing type animals would stick around for. So it was a way of keeping uh, animals in one place without having to follow them uh, as the grasses you know, were uh, being eaten up uh, from one place to another. That's possible. We don't know that that's happened, but that's uh, something that might have happened here in the big meadow. When you ask, how did this meadow get here? We don't know, <laughs> but that's a, a possible uh, a way that it might have been kept open a long time ago. Next, we're going to find out how later settlers uh, used the meadow and eventually how they changed it. We're standing on an old footpath that later became a wagon road, and it was a way that people came across the mountains from the Madison side on our east to the Page County side on our west. This path might have started out as a, a wild game path, a wild animal path that perhaps deer, uh, perhaps bison, perhaps elk might have made up to these cooler mountain uh, grazing areas in the summertime and then would follow those paths back down into the valley uh, in the winter time and hunters would often follow those game trails or paths eventually making uh, human uh, footpaths. So it's possible that this footpath uh, originated that way. We know that it was definitely used by European settlers after they came to the mountains and to come across the mountains right here. In the 1700s, the colonial era, Lord Fairfax was the proprietor of what they called the Northern Neck of Virginia, and he owned land here, and it was referred to as his Lordship's Meadow Tract. Um, so it was a meadow of some sort that far back, and we're talking about the 1740s. And what kind of meadow? We don't know exactly what it looked like. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about uh, that later. But other people from the eastern side of the mountain, wealthy people, had bought tracts of land up here and eventually were grazing animals here and uh, raising crops. Um, in the 1850s, uh, wealthier farmers from the Shenandoah Valley side, from the western side of the mountain, uh, owned tracts of land. There were several different tracts here and they grazed livestock such as cattle and sheep 
up here and would leave those animals here from the springtime, say April, when the grass has started to green up, and leave them to graze all the way uh, into October. And they would supplement those uh, uh, native grasses with uh, European uh, grasses, and they're still here. We'll see if we can find some for you a little bit later. Um, and they also supplemented the, the grazing with uh, uh, seed from clover, uh, European clover seed, and you'll find red and white clover here in the meadow as well. Um, still left over from those early days of grazing animals here in the meadow. Now those grazing animals helped to keep down any tree saplings that might be coming in and trying to create a forest. Um, people also would grub up unwanted uh, uh, things like ferns that the animals wouldn't eat, and that way they maintained an, an open grazing area. Now, as, as I said, we don't know what this meadow looked like uh, that long ago into the 17 or 1800s or even up to the early 1900s. We don't have pictures of the meadow from that time. We do know, however, that there were two main wetlands that were in this big meadows area, and we're going to go and visit one of those next. All right, this is the Timothy that uh, I was just talking about. This is a non-native grass. It was uh, brought from Europe by uh, farmers and they would use it to improve the, the foraging for their cattle and other livestock. There are quite a variety of native grasses here, but uh, this was also good forage. This is actually the, one of the hay grasses that we use for our uh, common you know, growth of hay, hay bales that we make uh, today. So Timothy still around is an important type of grass. And uh, when you see a lot of Timothy, uh, orchard grass is another uh, European grass that you see quite often in uh, old fields, as well as the red and white clover. When you see all of those together, you can be pretty sure that you're um, standing in an old field, a former grazing field. We're in the low central wetland in the Big Meadow, and we're looking at a vernal pool. This is a, a body of water that comes and goes. Uh, normally in the winter, spring, and fall, you have a, a fair amount of water uh, that, that comes to the surface. Um, and in the summertime, when we don't have much rain, that water table uh, gets lower and the water goes under the ground. We just had a, a lot of rain yesterday, and so our vernal pond is back again. Um, this is a type of place that is uh, important to wildlife. Uh, it's also, this is the one of two head streams that form Dark Hollow Falls. Uh, the meadow itself might look perfectly level, but it's actually tilted in this direction. So it's uh, tilting off to the northeast, and that water is going to drain in that direction and go down in about a mile from here uh, will form a, a waterfall, our closest waterfall to Skyline Drive called Dark Hollow Falls. But this is also important to wildlife. Uh, frogs, such as wood frogs and uh, tree frogs, uh, uh, spring peepers, um, all lay their eggs in or around this pond in the springtime, and um, salamanders as well. But it's also an important water source for uh, birds, such as our uh, barn swallows that come down and get mud uh, to build their nests with, and uh, deer, which will come and drink at the pond. You'll often find a lot of deer tracks around this pond, like we are uh, this morning. Um, and this was also important to the livestock that grazed up here. You had to have water for those animals. So it was important that there was a fresh water source up here on the mountains. So this meadow had just what uh, wildlife and other animals needed. And as important as it is and has been for animals, uh, humans have not always appreciated the value of this wetland. So at our next stop, we're going to find out how people changed the wetland in the 1930s. In the 1930s, gliders were all the rage. These were motorless airplanes, and serious hobbyists own, who owned them would try to set uh, altitude records in these uh, gliders or sailplanes or distance records. And it would help if they were able to take off from an area that was high up 
So the American Soaring Society uh, asked the park officials at the time if they could you have meets here. So in the fall of 1933, they held their first Soaring Society meet. And several people with their planes came and they set up a takeoff area up to my left, up on the hillside. There it slopes down and that's where the planes could take off and continue and use the thermals that were rising air currents and the updrafts here in the mountain to keep them aloft for as long as possible. And when they wanted to land, they would land here in the central part of the meadow. Unfortunately, it was pretty rocky. And so the rocks needed to be cleared in order for the planes to have safe takeoff and landing. So at that time, fortunately for the Soaring Society, there was another group here in the meadow at the other end that was the Big Meadows CCC camp, or Civilian Conservation Corps. And these were young men who worked in the park doing a variety of tasks, and we'll talk about them at another stop. But one of the things that they were able to do was to clear the rocks for the, the, uh, gliding, uh, the gliders and the sailplanes. So what did they do with those rocks? Truckloads of rocks were cleared from those areas and dumped in the central wetland. And that was because in the 1930s, the thinking was that wetlands were not of much value, that they were breeding grounds for mosquitoes and other insects, so let's get rid of them and make that land useful. And so the rocks were dumped in that central wetland where we were just talking about that drains off of the meadow and forms Dark Hollow Falls. And what the rocks did was displace that water, make it shallower and easier to dry up. So when, um, this was 1933 when the rocks were cleared and, and first dumped here. In 1934, the park uh, hired its first naturalist, uh, Maurice Sullivan, and when he came here, he was appalled to find that the wetland had been filled in. And so he complained to the park uh, officials at the time, but to no avail. The, the, uh, the place where we are right here was a 100-foot circumference pond, a vernal pond, just like the one we saw, only much bigger. And the, the CCC camp uh, leader told Sullivan that that previous uh, summer in uh, spring in 1933, thousands of American toads uh, were laying eggs in that, in that pond. So that's how, how important it was to, to those uh, amphibians. But also, um, we were told that, that ducks would land on that pond uh, when it was, when it was uh, full of water. And even humans would ice skate on that pond in the wintertime, the shallow pond pond, but uh, uh, enjoyed for a lot of, uh, of reasons and by a lot of people and animals. So Sullivan, you know, didn't have any luck uh, because those rocks are still here. And you can still see them today. They were never removed. The rocks are still here in what used to be the, the big pond. So we talked about farmers from the Shenandoah Valley who owned land up here on the mountaintop here in the Big Meadow from the 1850s on up to the 1930s when the park came in. Now those people didn't live up here and they needed people who could look after their, their land for them and they would often hire people who lived in the local area or um, have tenants uh, on their own land who could watch after the cattle, put salt out for them, mend the fences, make sure the animals could get to water, uh, and, and, and things like that. And one of those families that uh, was a tenant uh, for other farmers up here and uh, looked after the, the land for them uh, were the Weeklies. Uh, and we're at the place where they lived. Uh, Benjamin Franklin Weekly and Emma Susan Weekly grew up in the mountains here and came to live here in uh, 1882. The house had been built well before that, around the 1850s. Um, but uh, they raised 11 children up here uh, in this in this house and what we see here is just a part of it this is the cellar that would have been under part of the house and of course the cellars in those days were the refrigerators that's where you would store your your canned goods um, that you would put up in jars and uh, because the cellars were right against the the banks of the of the earth that kept cool and a, a pretty constant temperature throughout the year so it kept your food uh, as well behind the house or I should say in front of the 
house. The house faced that way uh, was the spring where the family could get water. Three big apple trees were right there. Two of them were still standing. Just walk out and get your apples. And their, their garden uh, where they grew their own food was uh, right over in that direction. They grew cabbage, potatoes, onions, uh, a wide variety of, of food. Um, Frank and Emma um, were here um, and well known here. When you think about where this house is, located, do you remember the path or the wagon road that we started out on? That road would have gone right in front of the house, just about maybe 500 yards or so in that direction. So anyone coming up from Madison, up winding up the mountains would have stopped here and maybe stopped at the spring, got some water, uh, stopped on the porch and shared the news with, with Frank and Emma and the kids. Uh, or coming up from the page side, same thing, winding up the the mountain road and wanting to stop and rest their, their teams or their feet and uh, would stop and, and talk to the weekly. So they were, they were pretty well, well known. Now that wagon road was in use uh, for a long time, but there was another road that went through just north of here um, at Fisher's Gap. On one side, uh, it's called the Rose River Fire Road, and on the other, the Page County side, the Redgate Fire Road, Rose River on the Madison side. And that was the old Blue Ridge Turnpike that was built in the 1850s. So another way that people crossed over the mountains, but that road came later. So people used both of those, but the weeklies were right at this place where people would cross and they got to be well known. Um, people would also stay here at the weekly home. They would stay for a day, a couple of days, a week, a couple of weeks. Um, Frank was a well-known um, hunter and fisherman, and he would take people out on, on guided uh, hunting and fishing tramps. And uh, Emma was a, a well-known cook, and she would make some nice home-cooked meals for everyone. So pretty, uh, pretty interesting uh, spot. And, and I like to bring people here to this spot just to remind you that um, there's more to this park than the nature that you see today. This is a place where people lived, and people like the Weeklies um, had uh, quite, quite an interesting life. Um, Frank was a very proud Union veteran of the Civil War, and uh, uh, Emma uh, was a, a pretty good seamstress as far as we know. We have a good picture of her with a, a crazy quilt that we think she made. And crazy quilts were uh, very popular starting in the 1880s or so. And you would take little patches, pieces of material that, uh, that meant something to you or that you just thought were pretty and put them in, in patterns and arrange them in ways. And uh, there's a family photo of, of Emma Susan with her crazy quilt and, and we like to think of what a legacy that would have been for uh, to hand down, you know, to her her children. A little pieces of cloth, maybe two of the, the weekly daughters were married right here in the big meadow, right near the house probably, and perhaps some of the material from their, their dresses uh, for their wedding uh, might have been in that uh, a quilt like that. We don't know, but but still what an interesting legacy that would be. Uh, to have. Um, Frank died in 1928 uh, at the age of 84 or 85 and Emma in 1933 at about the same age. Um, so they were able to live their lives uh, out uh, here where, where they uh, had always lived for 50 years or so. Uh, their son June lived about a quarter mile uh, behind us on a, as a tenant on another farm and he did have to leave with his family. He was one of the last uh, families to, his was one of the last families to leave the park uh, after Shenandoah National Park was established in 1935 and I believe they left in about 1937. So the next place we're going to go is the, the last cultural connection that we're going to uh, uh, talk about in the meadow before the park came in. Welcome to Civilian Conservation Corps Camp NP1, Camp Fechner, named for Robert Fechner, the director of the Civilian Conservation Corps. This was the first agency that uh, was created by the newly elected Franklin Roosevelt administration in May of 1933. The first two CCC camps that were in the national parks were right here in Shenandoah. Camp one was at Skyland and Camp two was right here at Big Meadows. Uh, this was an opportunity for young men who were 18 to 25 years old, um, living at home, single, 
and a family under a certain income level. Um, and they were able to work in national parks like Shenandoah all across the country, as well as national forests all around the country and state parks all around the country. They did a lot of work um, over the nine years that the program was in operation. Um, they would sign up for six months at a time. Uh, some of the things they did here at Shenandoah were uh, construct campgrounds, picnic areas, picnic tables, uh, cut down the dead chestnut trees that were killed by the blight, uh, made fence rails, uh, built all kinds of, of things, rock guard walls, the original walls uh, along Skyline Drive, helped to build the overlooks around uh, uh, Skyline Drive as the contractors were going along building the road. Uh, maintenance buildings, other buildings, uh, many of which are still standing uh, today. So their work uh, left a, a, a major imprint on our national parks and Shenandoah as well. Um, these boys earned $30 a month. They only saw $5 of that. The rest was sent home to their families so mom and dad could pay the rent or the mortgage by groceries and feed their families. So uh, it was a shot in the arm for the economy as uh, uh, boys needed uniforms, lots of shoes, shoe leather, tanneries, uh, farmers, you know, growing uh, produce, uh, just a, a lot of, of, of things uh, happening uh, in connection with the CCC uh, here. Archaeologists came uh, several years ago and uh, determined where the actual buildings were here in the CCC uh, camp. There were barracks uh, as well as administrative buildings, uh, uh, first aid buildings, and lavatories and things like that. Uh, the buildings have been marked with stakes and the uh, uh, Vegetation has been permitted to grow up inside them. So you can see where the buildings were and we have interpretive signs uh, around. So you can walk around out here at the uh, Big Meadows CCC camp and um, kind of see what life, imagine what life was like for these young men. They could serve six months uh, at a time and then they could sign up for another six months uh, if they wanted to. There were six CCC camps in total inside the boundaries of the newly being created Shenandoah National Park uh, and the National Park after it was established in 1935. Uh, and a couple of other camps outside the park and all of these supplied uh, uh, young men who would, who would work, do work in the parks. Uh, some of that work still very evident today. The men in this particular camp had a uh, special job to do in the summer of 1936, and that's where our next and final stop will be. So in the spring of 1936, these young CCC men were tasked with building platforms and cutting down chestnut logs of the dead trees that had died out here and uh, making them into seats. And they built a seating area way down in the middle of the meadow, kind of going up. And out in the very center of the meadow, that wetland where we saw that vernal pond, uh, is where they put some platforms. And on those platforms, uh, that's where the speakers were going to come for the park dedication on July 3rd, 1936. So cars were actually parked down in the meadow uh, all the way around, and people came from all over uh, for the dedication ceremony for Shenandoah National Park. The park was established in December of 1935, but they waited until the next summer to have the ceremony. And the guest speaker was Franklin Roosevelt, who was president, <coughs> excuse me, president at the time, and uh, very proud of the CCC camps. Uh, and he came to visit this camp uh, a couple of times while he was in office. Uh, he spoke uh, out there on that platform and he dedicated uh, this park, he said, for the recreation that we all do, that's what you're doing out here uh, at, in the park today, and recreation, uh, which we find here. And what he meant was a couple of things. He meant that the CCC boys were kind of recreating themselves uh, and helping to recreate the economy through the CCC with the work that they were doing. Um, he also meant that uh, by recreation that uh, nature was essentially being invited to come back into the places where people had been for all of these 
years, we talked about Native uh, Americans hunting here thousands of years ago. And later on, um, settlers uh, owning land up here, grazing livestock, raising families uh, like the Weeklies. And even the CCC now has become part of the cultural story here. And when you combine all of those different human uses uh, of that meadow, there's really not any other place in this park that has that combination of those things. And then you combine that with all of the amazing natural features here in this high elevation open wetland and the rare plants. The mafic fen habitat is very unusual here and some of the, the rare plants and animals that you find here. It makes for quite a uh, crazy quilt, if you want to say, of pieces. But you put them all together and just like uh, Mrs. Weekly's quilt, uh, it makes for quite an interesting legacy. And that's our uh, legacy of this big meadow. And because of all of those unique pieces fitting together so well into this crazy quilt that we call the Big Meadow, that's why we continue to protect it here in Shenandoah National Park. Thank you for joining me today, and I hope to see you again on another episode of A Big Meadow Walk with Ranger Mara. Thank you.